Now, um, I thought for acknowledgement today, all I need to do is talk about the mural, really. Um, as, as you would have seen, um, it's sort of gradually taking shape. And John's been a little bit cheeky on the social media, sort of putting out teasing photos and uh, saying, trying to get people to guess what's going on and what it's going to be. <laughs> That's been a bit of fun. And um, yeah, but essentially it will be, it, it'll be, it'll be, like that's obviously a photo, but it'll be kind of a, a representation of our local area, including Kalungari and uh, the greenness of our of this country and the water. And um, there'll be poles on there, and the poles are they're kind of representative as well. In that, on Moyan Hill back in the late eighteen hundreds, I think. Uh, a surveyor who also became a um, uh, an anthropologist. Like back in those days, you didn't have very, really didn't have professional anthropologists. You had lay people just doing it out of their interest. And he was a surveyor, um, R.H. Matthews. And uh, the Aboriginal pe local Aboriginal people showed him uh, Moyan Hill, and he noticed lots of scarred trees. So, you know, the bark, some of the bark taken out and some designs on, on the scars. And he, he did do little sketches of some of them. He, there were 29 scarred trees that he saw. They'd be all gone now. And um, he, he did some sketches of about nine of them. But they're not using those sketches. They're just using contemporary sort of uh, Aboriginal designs. And the general purpose is simply honouring and remembering their ancestors, like we honour and remember our ancestors at different times and uh, people of the past who have been upon which the present is built in terms of community and, and um, strength. That we like to acknowledge our past um, family members or faith members for our strength today, the things that they've given us and handed on to us. So it's that's kind of the the general gist of what will be on the on the wall. Yeah. So yeah. it's kind of like an acknowledgement of the, the people that God placed here first to be custodians, to be stewards, and look after the country. Let's pray. <clears throat> oh God, we need peace. So we come for quiet. We need joy. So we come for singing. We need to let things go. So we also come for forgiveness. We need hope. So we come for scripture and community. We come this morning from our own agendas. Help us to leave with the blessings we long for and your unexpected gifts. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's come to God with our prayer of confession. Let's pray. O oh God, we pray that you will bring into our hearts and minds, into our plans and actions, into our hopes and prayers, a greater love for all people. Break the silence of prejudice. Break the isolation of ignorance. Break the false sense of security in earthly fortresses. And erase the fear that prevents communication. Help us to come home to your love by becoming one family on this planet 
we all call home. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, Chris is going to lead us. Thank you. This morning, <coughs> excuse me, is from Genesis uh, chapter 18. A son promised to Abraham and Sarah. The Lord appeared to Abraham by the oaks of Mamre as he sat at the entrance of his tent in the heat of the day. He looked up and saw three men standing near him. When he saw them, he ran from the tent entrance to greet them and bowed down to the ground. He said, My Lord, if I find favour with you, do not pass by your servant. Let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. Let me bring a little bread that you may refresh yourselves and after that you may pass on since you've come to your servant. So they said, Do as you said. And Abraham hastened into the tent to Sarah and said, Make ready quickly three measures of choice flour, knead it and make cakes. Abraham ran to the herd and took a calf, tender and good, and gave it to the servant who hastened to prepare it. Then he took curds and milk and the calf that had been prepared and set it before them. And he stood by them under the tree while they ate. They said to him, Where is your wife Sarah? And he said, uh, There, in the tent. Then one said, I will surely return to you in due season, and your wife Sarah shall have a son. And Sarah was listening at the tent entrance behind him. Now, Abraham and Sarah were old, advanced in age. It had ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of women. So Sarah laughed to herself, saying, <laughs> After I've grown old and my husband is old, shall I have pleasure? The Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh and say, Shall I indeed bear a child now that I'm old? Is anything too wonderful for the Lord? At the set time, I will return to you in due season, and Sarah shall have a son. But Sarah denied, saying, I did not laugh, for she was afraid. He said, Oh yes, you did laugh. Second reading is from Romans. When I can get to it. Romans chapter 5. Results of justification. Therefore, since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained, obtained access to this grace in which we stand. We boast in our hope of sharing the glory of God. And not only that, but we also boast to our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character character produces hope and hope does not disappoint us because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us for while we were still weak at the right time Christ died for the ungodly indeed rarely will anyone die for a great righteous person though perhaps for a good person someone might actually dare to die but God proves his love to, for us in that while we still were sinners, Christ died for us. The third reading is from Matthew. Towards the end of chapter 9 and through into 10. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore ask the Lord of the harvest to send our laborers into his harvest. Then Jesus summoned his twelve disciples 
and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to cure every disease and every sickness. These are the names of the twelve apostles. First, Simon, also known as Peter, and his brother Andrew, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, James, son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus, and Simon the Canaanite, and Judas Iscariot, the one who betrayed him. These twelve Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Go nowhere near and go nowhere among the Gentiles and enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. As you go, proclaim the good news. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Cure the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out the demons. You receive without payment, give without payment. I like to read the Times, by which I mean not a newspaper by the name of the Times, but the Times. What's happening in our world around us, I like to read that, have a go anyway. And I like to do that alongside reading the Scriptures. Of course, as you all know, I have a particular interest in the debates, arguments and discussions revolving around the voice referendum. However, I also like to pay attention to things much wider afield than that as well. Particularly big picture things. That's part of who I am. And noting uh, public debate and discussions lately, both here and overseas, I reckon that line in Matthew's Gospel resonates a lot. When he saw the crowds, when Jesus saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. I had a look at uh, some other translations to see what other words were used to describe the crowds. Many of them do use harassed and helpless, but some other words that were used were troubled, confused, fainted, someone said fainted, and were scattered, bewildered, aimless, and I think all of them used like sheep without a shepherd. I really do shake my head and wince at some of the crazy shenanigans that people can get up to as they relate to others, whether it be words spoken or written or in their behaviour. Like sheep without a shepherd, indeed. And sometimes it's not just doing silly stuff or saying silly things, sometimes it's downright nasty. What did I find as I read this week's scriptures? Well, starting with this verse itself, Jesus' compassion, Jesus' love. But then in, across all the passages, there is much about God's love God's grace, God's peace, and the offering by God of life. The place for God's love and compassion is in community, through relationships. 
which reminded me of the last time I was here as we looked at the Trinity and the essence of God in mutual, dynamic, exchanging relationships and how we are created in the image of that triune God. So we too have that as our essence of dynamic moving and uh, relationships and mutual relationships where this love and grace can happen. This sheds light for me on the, on the passage from Genesis. What a huge effort Abraham and Sarah put in to be hospitable to these visiting strangers. Just imagine what our world would be like if everyone had this attitude of grace, welcome, generosity, hospitality, love towards strangers and neighbours. In God's generosity and grace and love, beyond all hope and beyond all our logic, Abraham and Sarah receive the gift of a new life. In our own lives, we tend to hold on to our logic, our way of thinking. God wants to break through it and open up a new way of being. Too often, though, we're afraid to let that happen to us. Because if we do that, we lose some sense of control over our lives. We don't have control over our future when we let God enter into the centre of our being. God calls us to move away from our finite world of thinking, our small, manageable, controlled world, to a world of abundance and to a way of thinking about abundance. The disciples had a mentality of scarcity, and so do we. We think there's not enough, not enough for everyone. So we have to be careful with what we have. Going alongside that is being fearful. We become afraid, and that fear creeps up on us in all kinds of ways. I think it's a key factor in this, what Jesus observed about the people feeling harassed and troubled and helpless and confused. It's this fear that many of us have. We're afraid for ourselves. We're afraid of others. We can be afraid of God sometimes. Fear can be a pervasive quality in our lives. Fear makes us think in terms of scarcity. It makes us think, this is a dangerous world. How am I going to survive? There's not enough for everyone. There's not enough food for everyone. There's not enough knowledge for everyone. There's not enough affection. And I want to live. I want to be sure that I live. I want to stay alive. All this is very common for us human beings. And when we're concerned that there isn't enough, one of our first responses is to start hoarding. We start hoarding to borrow from some um, scriptural passages, bread and fish, food. We start hoarding other things, though, like honour. We start hoarding affection, trying to cling on to close people and, and hold them tight, not let them go. We start hoarding knowledge. We start hoarding ideas. And if we think with a scarcity mentality, we find ourselves with enemies who want to take some of what we have hoarded. And we are more and more afraid because the more we have, the more people will want our surplus 
the more surplus we have, the more we're going to build walls around it, what we have hoarded. And the higher the walls get, the more fear we have of the enemies that we imagine outside the walls. We start building bombs, literally as well as metaphorically, to protect us from our imagined enemies. And then we get scared of the bombs that our enemies might build in retaliation. We find ourselves in a prison that we built ourselves because of a fear that comes out of a mentality of scarcity, of not having enough. This mentality is very visible in the gospel. Jesus is saying, on the other hand, that God is a God of abundance. Wherever Jesus appears, there is not only life, but life to the full. We hear about incredible miracles and healing and, and things that he's offering to the people constantly all the time in, in today's message. Wherever Jesus appears, there's this life to the full. Jesus comes to bring life. He brings much more than we even ask for. Jesus always offers us something beyond our expectations. The reality that Jesus keeps promising is a reality that we can't even grasp. He speaks about eternal life, the truth, the light, the life. So following Jesus, as described in the gospel, is first of all an invitation to follow the Lord of abundance. We're invited to follow the Lord even if we can't fully absorb the enormousness of this divine hospitality. Fear can be what makes us hold on to our position and hold on to our possessions. Makes us hold on to what we have because we're afraid we will lose what we need. Love is about overcoming fear. Love is letting go and trusting that in letting go, life will multiply. Life will become more. Jesus invites us to follow him, to let go of our logic, let go of our way of thinking, let go of our fears and trust that something new will happen. We will enter into the kingdom of abundance, of joy, of peace, of freedom. Our discipleship, our following of Jesus, our walking with Jesus does not stop there though. If it did, it would be quite self-centred. Like Jesus, we need to have compassion for those around us who are harassed and helpless, troubled and confused, behaving like sheep without a shepherd. In our world full of strangers, estranged from their own past, some estranged from their culture, some estranged from their country or their home, some estranged from neighbours and friends and family, some estranged from their deepest self, some estranged God. We witness a painful search for a hospitable place where life can be lived without fear and where community can be found. Although many, we might say even most strangers in this world, become easily the victim of a fearful hostility, we see that in some of our reading of the times, 
how much fear is used to stir and scare people. So even though many strangers in the world do fall into that trap easily and ourselves, it's possible for people generally and obligatory for Christians to offer an open and hospitable space where strangers can cast off their strangeness and become our fellow human beings. The movement from hostility to hospitality is hard and full of difficulties. Our society seems to be increasingly full of fearful, defensive, aggressive people anxiously clinging to their property and inclined to look at their surrounding world with suspicion always expecting an enemy to suddenly appear and intrude and do harm. But still, this is our vocation, our calling, to convert the enemy into a guest and to create the free and fearless space where relationships can be formed and fully experienced. Hospitality means primarily the creation of a free space where this stranger can enter and become a friend instead of an enemy. Hospitality is not to change people, but to offer them space where change can take place. And we often, like uh, Abraham and Sarah, offered hospitable space and uh, of course one of the things about hospitality is that anybody can change in that space, the host and the guest it's not about bringing people over to our side but to offer freedom not disturbed by dividing lines so the paradox of hospitality is that it wants to create emptiness not a fearful emptiness, but a friendly emptiness where strangers can enter and discover themselves as created free. Free to sing their own songs, speak their own languages, dance their own dances. Free also to leave and follow their own calling. But I think this is tied up in what we talked about in the Trinity. In that space we have relationship and trust and love and grace and we learn as, as I've been saying that, and as the Gospel says in that sort of space with all those things happening new life can arise for anybody in that space. So God invites us to cultivate a brave space where people, including ourselves, can encounter the God who brings life. Amen. Gracious God, we pray for the things that are on our calendar for this coming week. We pray for our social craft group, and we give you thanks for that group and for the opportunities that it gives for conversation and laughter, for deep conversation sometimes, for the expression of creativity, for the learning, and for the cups of tea. And we thank you for those who have led that group for so long. We pray for the church council meeting on Tuesday. We pray that your spirit will guide the thinking and the speaking and the decision making in that meeting. We pray for computers for seniors on Wednesday. And once again, we thank you for those people who have led and supported that group for a long time. We thank you for the learning that seniors have the opportunity uh, 
things that they can learn in that group. We thank you for the conversations that happen at morning tea and for the little community that has developed there over time. We pray too for our community library. We thank you for the volunteers who keep that ticking along week by week. We thank you for the conversations that happen there over a cup of tea or a mug of coffee. And we pray for the mural launch on Sunday afternoon. May that be a time of learning and of celebration and of coming together. We pray for those that we know who are ill at the moment, having treatment for various uh, diseases, recovering from accidents. We pray for those who are grieving. We pray, O oh God, for the other congregations in our zone. We think of Bomaderry and Shoalhaven Central and Milton Ulladulla. We pray for the leaders in each of those congregations. And we pray for your spirit to be leading each of those as they seek ways to share your love in their particular communities. We pray for the friends and families of those who died in the bus crash in the Hunter Valley. We pray for those recovering in hospital. And we thank you and pray for the first responders on the scene. We pray that those who have been affected by what they saw will receive the support that they need. And may they all know God's abundant love and mercy. We pray for our partner congregations in the Uniting Church prayer chain, Lake Macquarie Uniting Church, the Warners Bay and Bullaroo congregations, and the Hoju Korean Church in Sydney. We pray for those who are recognised in the King's Birthday Honours List. We give thanks for the ways in which so many people so generously offer their gifts and time to make a difference to others in their community. As we begin Refugee Week today, we give thanks for people who have come to Australia seeking asylum and refu refuge. We give thanks for the contributions that so many of them have made to our society and for the way that they have enriched our society by the blending of cultures. At the same time, we think about those who are still being held in detention. We pray for the 22 people left on Nauru. And we give thanks for the news this week that the government is seeking ways to resettle them into other countries. At the same time, we remember the ones who are left in Port Moresby. Some of them have given up hope of ever being resettled and being able to begin a new and worthwhile life. So we continue to pray that the government will have a change of heart and treat these people in a humane way. It's our church anniversary this week and we do pray for our church. We pray for the Act 2 project and the uh, bindings that 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 might bring to light, that will help us to be a more effective church across this country, a church that follows you, lives up to your values and your standards, and brings your love wherever we can. We pray for all of the conversations about the recognition of uh, the First Peoples in the Constitution and the voice to Parliament. We pray that those conversations will be civil and polite, that they will be focused on understanding rather than
arguing for uh, particular positions. And lastly, we pray for peace in our world, and in particular, we think of Ukraine under attack from Russia. We do pray that there would be some kind of a miracle that would see that conflict brought to an end. We pray these things in the name of Jesus, the bringer of healing and hope and peace. Go in peace and may the holy God surprise you on your way. Christ Jesus be your company and the spirit lift up your life this day and always. Amen.